Hey everybody, so I'm going to be answering a question that was put to me in the forums. I don't have the computer in front of me. I'm just uh, preparing a tea. Anyway, so somebody asked me, how do you transition into selling IP, selling intellectual property from being a freelancer, I guess, or from selling your time? And the ultimate goal, I think, well, depending on what you want to do, now, for me, the ultimate goal because of lifestyle is to sell IP, intellectual property. But it's actually the most challenging type of business to set up. So you have a lot of lead time in that situation. So my first business, I was actually selling product. And then later on, I was selling IP. No, so I was selling product, then I went into freelancing. And then I started selling IP uh, in terms of uh, a SaaS a software as a service, and then I went into selling content, the courses in 2003. So how do you transition into that? First thing you got to do is you got to develop your basic coding skills, your web skills, the studio web web skills. Why? Because these are tools that you can use to position yourself to be able to have an IP-based business, an intellectual property-based business, whether it be a SaaS or whatnot. In his question, he uh, said specifically he didn't want to have to talk in front of the camera and so forth. That I understand. It was very uncomfortable for me for several years, in fact. It took me, it took me hundreds of videos, hun literally hundreds and hundreds of videos before I started becoming comfortable. It's weird when you see this camera in front of you for most people, they kind of freeze up as I did. And I think what it is, is it's going to sound weird. I think this is my theory. I think the reason people freeze up in front of the camera because you got this eye, this giant eye and your lizard brain, your lower brain. Remember I studied, I studied psychology in university. That was my major. So your lizard brain, your lower brain may perceive that as an unknown predator, this giant eye looking at you. What's this eye looking at me for? So you have to get your lizard brain used to the idea that this eye is not dangerous. Again, this is one of my theories based on my study of psychology. So that's why people are nervous in front of the camera. Okay, back on point. So yes, you can develop an IP-based business without having to be on camera, without having to produce content. A SaaS is a big uh, example of that, a software as a service. Now, for me, I've had a few SaaSes out there. I've mentioned my dating site in the past, which I shut down before I really started getting traction, which, you know, in retrospect, I think it was a big mistake. And uh, why did I shut it down? Because I didn't want to be associated with a bunch of swingers. Anyhow, uh, so my current software as a service is Studio Web, which is used by many, many schools. And that's growing as well. But that didn't come in overnight, which brings me to the basic strategy that I suggest that you implement. So what you have to do to be able to produce a SaaS that could be effective in the marketplace, meaning where it can make you money, is you have to really know that marketplace well. The mistake that I see a lot of people make, I don't know if it's a mistake, well, it's a mistake in my opinion, is that they, they are coders and from the outside, they look into an industry to try to figure out what it is they can do to modernize that industry. So why is that a mistake? Because when you're looking from the outside in, you're only going to have at best a superficial knowledge of what's going on within an industry. And so you're likely going to make costly mistakes. And I spoke about this in the course, I believe. I talked about the bird food situation where I brought in all this bird food, a couple thousand pounds, and uh, it turned out to be a, not a very, well, it turned out to be a disaster because I didn't understand the key component of, of what makes a good bird food. Anyway, I won't rehash that story. So with Studio Web, when I built that prototype seven years ago, well, my team, I had an idea in my head what I wanted in terms of an educational system based on my experience teaching code. But I didn't have any experience at that point in time in terms of teaching code within a classroom. I didn't do it myself. And what I discovered 
Well, I discovered a lot of things. I discovered a lot of things about how schools operate, how teachers operate over time. So when I built the first iteration of Studio Web, it was based on my ideas, and I deployed it to the public, and it worked great. But when I got contacted by a couple of schools, I had only built, we had only built a superficial implementation of how Studio Web could work in a classroom. I won't get into details. It was just basic, essentially. So the schools, a couple of schools adopted it, and then all those tech support questions started coming in. And over the years, we've had to make major, major changes to the Studio Web code base and the way the app actually works to, uh, so, that it, so it aligns with what schools need. And I would say that maybe 50%, 60% of the original Studio Web is in place in terms of how it works. Uh, that's, there might be a hundred little things in there that uh, allow it to be uh, functional within the school context. Very different from when individuals such as yourself are just using Studio Web uh, to learn from home. It's a different game altogether. So because I was not working inside the school systems, I didn't have internal knowledge about how schools work in the U.S. especially. Now, I come from a family of teachers, my father, aunts, uncles, so I had some ideas, you know, and you sit around, you, you grow up with teachers, you get a pretty good idea of what's going on there. It's still not the same as being an employee working there, so I didn't have the whole picture, I had half the picture. And as a result, I had to, we had to do a lot of rewriting, a lot of patching, a lot of changes to Studio Web, uh, the core app itself, and the business model to suit what was required to get into the school systems. And that took many years. Uh, I perhaps I could have sped it up, but because of the nature of schools, it takes a long time. Fortunately, I was in a position where I was able to fund it myself. I didn't have to go to VC, so I was self-funding, and uh, I acted as the angel investor in the first round myself. And I brought it through to profitability. Studio Web was a big money loser for me for several years, and that was because, again, I didn't have a good internal understanding of how the schools worked in the U.S., how they functioned, what the bureaucracy was, and what they would need specifically. So for you, when you go into any particular industry, whether it be restaurants or the barbershop, the more important thing to have is than the, than the coding skills is actually have the business knowledge, to have that business intelligence, to know how that business operates. So how can you as a developer get into this? Well, first thing, you develop your skills, and then what you do, you start doing some freelancing, you start talking with people in different industries, business owners or people working it. And eventually, more than eventually, very, more quickly than you might think, you're gonna start seeing potential, and let me underline that, potential opportunities where you might be able to implement some sort of SaaS, some sort of IP that could sell, you could sell into that industry. But, when you do come up with some ideas, you gotta be you gotta be humble about your ideas because most of your ideas will be wrong. See, that's one of the things you have to. People think that entrepreneurs are arrogant; they have to have confidence. But the best entrepreneurs are confident, but they're also humble. They know that there's going to be a lot of mistakes, and they have to be willing to uh, admit they're wrong and make changes accordingly. So, let's say you were looking at a potential opportunity in the restaurant business. What I would do is I would do some research as much as you could on the web, start, ask, start looking around, see what's out there, and if you still see that opportunity, then sort of map out the idea very roughly on paper so you have a clear idea, and then come up with a, like the, a way you could describe it to a restaurateur in just a minute or two. And then you start talking to, hopefully, you know some restaurateurs. I know a few myself, so I would go talk to them and say, hey, I have this idea. How about this, 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 and this? What, would, would you find that interesting? And see what they say. And that, you know, don't just base it on one person. Ask like five or six restaurants, for example. See what they say, different types, and find out whether or not the idea has at least initial traction. That is huge. If it does have initial traction, then the next thing you got to do is uh, you got to see if you can get them to commit to deploying uh, an alpha or a beta 
or better yet, see if they're willing to invest in the first version in advance. You see, a lot of people will say, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea, but when it comes to actually committing to it, it comes to actually spending money especially, you're going to see a lot of people are going to start not being so committed. So it's a process, right? It's a process just like writing software, first version is not the best version. You got to keep iterating through it, refine it, refine it. Same thing with business ideas. You're going to do that. What's going to be your big problem in the end is not finding an idea, is finding a good idea. You're going to start finding all kinds of ideas. Like I am literally inundated with business opportunities, which I, I refuse constantly because I just don't have the time. So how do you pick the good ideas? Well, this process is simple. Well, what you do is you, you do what you, I just suggested, those steps, and then you throw it out there into the market as quickly and as dirtily as possible. Dirty code, alpha code, get it out there, see if there's any traction. And how do you know if there's traction? When people are going to put money down. That's when you know there's traction. And that was the piece of advice I got from one of my mentors way back in the day. I said, how do you choose what business to pursue? He said, follow the money. Follow the money. If you suggest an idea and people are willing to give you money for it, then you know you may have something and then you can pursue that. If you, hit, you have a brilliant idea and, and you go see six restaurant tours, to use that example, and they say to you, nah, I don't know, it's probably not going to be any good. So keep that in mind. You've got to be patient. You've got to be iterative. You have to be willing to explore ideas. Meanwhile, you do freelancing because freelancing not only will help you develop your chops, you know, have other people pay you to become a better developer. So when you finally develop your own SaaS, you're going to be much better at what you do. But at the same time, you're going to be making contacts. You're going to be learning about people's businesses and their industries. I hope that helps. Ciao, ciao.